<laughs> Thank you. Let's start with prayer. Lord Jesus, we wish to love you as you deserve, but we know we never will, though you love us, though we do not deserve it. Send your spirit now to work in our hearts, our minds, our imaginations, that we may be more disciplined by that spirit to become better disciples of yours, for Christ's sake. Amen. When uh, discussing this weekend with Jean, he said, um, would you like to talk about the Sermon on the Mount on Sunday morning? And, uh, you don't have to ask me to do that. You have to stop me doing it, usually. Um, and uh, So that's what I'm going to do. It's a joy to talk to a group of people who are seeking to be disciples. And I know no passage in the Bible that is of greater assistance to people with that desire. Because the Sermon on the Mount is about the distinction between a mere believer and a disciple. All of you are believers, I'm sure. You wouldn't be here otherwise. What Jesus does in the Sermon on the Mount is help you to work out whether you're a disciple. And he does it not the way we would do it. Before I get started, I want to say two other things about the Bible. Does the Bible always speak to you? No immediate yes, yes, yes. No pumping the air, is there? Because the answer is no, isn't it? And for doctors and medical students and residents, it can be a long time sometimes from one moment where the Bible speaks to another, right? Anybody deny that? Because uh, so, for some of you it's not true, and I want to know who you are because I want you to pray for me. But for most of you it's true, isn't it? For academics it's the worst. For a Christian academic, ten years is a typical longest period in the wilderness where the Bible does not speak. You may open the book, read it, may even teach Sunday school, go to church, and it doesn't speak to your heart. Um, for ordinary docs, it's still measured at least in months and usually in years. Uh, and we never talk about it. We need to. It's a, a way in which that text about bearing one another's burdens can be used. Because when we can't read ourselves, others can read to us. But only if we tell them. So find a, a group of people that you can be accountable to and with. The second thing that I wish I'd learned years and years and years ago is that there is actually one bit of the Bible that you can read all the while. But you have to have done it first so that when the black bits come you know where to go. Now which bit of the Bible is that? That's right, the Psalms. Do an experiment for me. For the next month when you wake in the morning, do two things. Say the Lord's Prayer to yourself twice. I'll explain why in a moment. And read one psalm. You, read the, you say the Lord's Prayer twice, because once you're going to say it by rote, aren't you? You just go through it. The rhythm is part of your soul. The second time, ask God to stop you somewhere. doesn't matter where. And that will be the starting point for your meditation during that day when there are moments that you can actually stop, even for a few seconds. You've got a starting point so that your mind doesn't go off in wasteful directions, which it does most of the time. This is what Fenelon means about training the will. Wonderful, but if you haven't met Fenelon, by the way, go get him. He was, by the way, number one on A.W. Tozer's reading list after the Bible. Uh, he didn't say that because his church wouldn't understand because Fenelon was a Catholic bishop, but uh, we're past that now, hopefully. Um, so read a psalm a day and say the, uh, the Lord's Prayer twice. On the second occasion, ask him to stop you. Now, if Americans had written the Lord's Prayer, what would the first word be? My. But it isn't. That can keep you thinking for a long, long time, <laughs> especially in an organization like CMDA. Um, just try it. And the Psalms, if you read one a day, you go through the, obviously not 119 in one go, but uh, you can be 
less than obsessive compulsive about it, uh, you'll go through the Psalms twice a year. That means that in a little while you will begin to know them at a deeper level. And the reason for doing that is that the Psalms are the one place in the Bible where the rubber hits the road big time. Uh, there are even psalms that begin in unmitigated gloom and end in unmitigated gloom. Now, there are days like that, aren't there? So there's a psalm for that day. Uh, and they teach you disciplines that the church needs so badly. We, we spend, especially in the evangelical church, a lot of time trying to feel that we are Christian. What the psalms do is remember that we did feel that we were Christian. And that's very significantly different. God knows your thoughts better than you do, so don't play silly games and have pious phrases. If you're angry with God, say so. He's already heard that you're angry. <laughs> the only person who hasn't known it is you, and you haven't known how bad it is, so let it all hang out. He doesn't get mad with you. You soon learn the model of the Psalms, tell the truth, and then let God do what he will with it. And of course, what he normally does is say, is that the whole story? <laughs> And of course it never is. And so the second half, or the next step, is usually to repeat history. And we're a, an ahistorical people now, and that's a great problem. How many of you have not written down your conversion story and your Christian journey down? You should do that. You should do it for your children at least. Warts and all, especially the warts. Uh, they need to know how, how badly wrong you went and that God is still merciful. Um, do that. The Psalms do that. Of course, when you start re recapitulating the history, your anger, your gloom, whatever, gets put into a bigger picture. It takes on uh, a more reasonable understanding. And often, by the end of the Psalm, the Psalmist is in a better space. Sometimes he isn't. But he does say things like, not, I feel like worshipping the Lord, but... I remember that I did feel like worshipping the Lord. I remember that I did go into the house of the Lord with rejoicing. And the conclusion is simple, isn't it? Maybe I will again. There's hope. That's step one. So try those two disciplines as, uh, for a month. If you do it for a month, you'll never stop. Uh, that's the way it works. Now our Lord's words. Bonhoeffer said somewhere, I think it's in Life Together or Living Together, always get that title wrong, that you should ask God for a passage of scripture from you to him at regular intervals in your life, especially when you're in the wilderness. Uh, all you do is add to your prayer every day, Lord, bring a passage of scripture to my life. Bring it to life for me, from you. And he will do that. It's dangerous, I warn you, but he will do it. Um, and those are the best times. Uh, and for me, the most important one of those times was, in fact, the Sermon on the Mount some 20 years ago now. I'm still working on it. It totally... It's, there's no question in my life it's been more important as in terms of what I do now than my conversion, because I don't have a conversion story as such. I don't remember the moment. There was no moment. Uh, but this I do remember. And it was students who pushed me into it, but that's another. It's irrelevant to now, because I want us now to try, if the Holy Spirit is willing, to go back to that hillside 2,000 years ago and imagine ourselves sitting there, wanting to get our lives sorted out. I've no doubt that it was Matthew's conversion story. Matthew probably ripped Jesus off, I think, and... Then he heard that this young man who, when he was ripped off, did not lose his call, but looked at Matthew and said, you've got it all wrong. And so when he heard that in his terms he had become a traveling rabbi, there was no way he would not go and listen, especially when he heard he was doing miracles. And in Matthew 4, Matthew recounts that Jesus healed many people at the end of Matthew 4. But the Son on the Mount is actually got a special dedication for doctors. It's our passage in the Bible, if there is one. And it begins with something that should be on every doctor's fridge. There were crowds being healed the night before, and it says, 
The next morning, seeing the crowds, Jesus went up the mountain. <coughs> Just think about that for a while. Get your priorities straight. It's wonderful to heal people. As was rightly said, God has no needs. He could heal everyone without any help from us whatsoever. He did not spend all his life healing, as we would have done, because there were bigger and more important things to do. He went up the mountain. There were lots of sick people still there in the village. And when he got up the mountain, Matthew, I think, was following. Matthew is also a good model for us, probably the best gospel writer for us, because he trashed his heritage for money. That's what he'd done. Does that strike a medical bell? Uh, we all trash our heritages for money or some equivalent thereof at times. And that's what Matthew had done. And he discovered it was not satisfying. So here was a man looking for the meaning of life, not knowing where he was going to find it, and in for the shock of his life. And the first words he heard were not from a How to Improve Your Life help book. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That is the start of discipleship. There is no other starting point. If you haven't been there, you haven't started. Now, what I had to realize as the Sermon on the Mount came to life in my life was that we didn't have the Sermon on the Mount in the Bible. Now, I'm not being heretical. Relax. What we have in the Bible is something a professor knows quite a lot about. Lecture notes. The Sermon on the Mount is just the lecture notes, not the sermon. Your job is to go from the notes back to the real thing. And that's not always easy to do, is it? Notes turn out to be very unsatisfying every now and again because we just write the wrong things down. Fortunately, Matthew didn't. I think there are at least two reasons for that. One, that he came from a society which was, bit, which was a much more oral society, but much more importantly, I have no doubt whatsoever that he heard this sermon many times. It says, Jesus went from village to village preaching the kingdom. This is the heart of the kingdom. Once you've actually internalized this sermon, you will find it all the way through the New Testament. Uh, it's there, everywhere. The book of James is a straight commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. But it's everywhere. Uh, and it wasn't fully understood when it was first heard because, as the Bible is so often, it is a book that has immediate meaning and it has another meaning and another meaning and a richer and a richer meaning. There's not one fulfillment of prophecy in most cases. There are multiple fulfillments. Uh, it is an incredibly textured and rich book. And this sermon is probably, well, the greatest sermon preached by the greatest preacher of all time. That's what it is. And yet you rarely hear it taught in church. The reason is that you can teach the epistles from your desk. The easiest thing in the world is to write a sermon using Paul as the text. Because you only have to apply your mind and you've got a sermon. Jesus is much more, much more demanding. You can't preach on the Gospels except from your knees. Because he, he doesn't give us a great deal of church rules or doctrine, does he? He says a little bit, tells you a story and says, go figure. Uh, you, can only deal, you can only figure on your knees. So what did he say? What we have to do is take each phrase, which is aphoristic, and ask the question, how did he explain this? Because blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's not a self-explanatory statement, is it? It needs some development. It's crying out for some development. You undoubtedly got it. What did Jesus say? Well, you do that by... Comparing scripture with scripture. Now, poor in spirit, what does that mean? Well, I think what he said is something like this. He said, you are poor in spirit. When? 
when you ask God to show you what your heart looks like to him. Think about it. If you get down on your knees and say, not Lord, give me this, this and this, but Lord, what do I look like to you? Do you discover good news? Raise your hand if you do. No one does, right? It's never good news, is it? No. That's the beginning of the kingdom. He's showing us a new way of kingdom. Everybody who was listening wanted the kingdom, but their kingdom was throwing out the Romans and ruling the world. And Jesus said, no, no. My kingdom's not like that. And it begins with poverty of spirit. Lewis captures it superbly in, uh, in his quasi-biography uh, where he's done his first degree at Oxford. If you ever read that book, uh, don't bother with the first part about English early education. Start after the First World War or at the First World War. So he's at Oxford. He's done one degree, got a first class degree. Very sure he's the smartest guy in the universe. Um, an atheist. But there isn't a job. The only thing he's fit to be is a professor, and there wasn't a job available. So his father agrees to pay for a second degree. And he goes to his first Oxford tutorial in that second degree. A group of people, like five, six, seven, eight people. Uh, how long does it take a group of students to decide who's bright in a group of eight students? Milliseconds. Uh, you know who it is. Uh, two sentences, and you oh, God, one of those. You know, uh, that's what it was like, and he'd been set up because in that group were three people at least who were going to have a major impact on Christianity in Britain in the next 50 years. One of them was Lewis, but he didn't know that at this point. But the two minds that he had to engage most in that group were both Christian theists. And over the next few weeks, they persuaded him that he was a fool to be an atheist. Pascal's wager at one level. And they won that argument. And so Lewis describes, now as a theist, as he put it elsewhere beautifully, to believe that mind could come from mindlessness is like believing that cabbages, as well as giving, as be, resulting from the laws of botany, give lectures on the subject. That's what's wrong, by the way, with the design hypothesis. It should always start with metaphysical design and what it means to be human, not physical. Uh, because that's much more interesting and it's also much more undeniable. Uh, that's what Lewis did. And he got down on his knees and he said something like this. He said, I, di I discovered that I was a zoo of ambition, a bedlam of hatred, a harem of lust. My name was Legion. That's what happens to all of us, isn't it? The more willing we are to be truly honest, the more we realize what the problems are and how overwhelming to us they are. God fortunately doesn't let us see it all at one go. We'd give up and commit suicide, I think, if we did. Uh, he shows us the bit he's going to work on next. Now, that didn't make Lewis a Christian. It made him a very uncomfortable theist. In fact, he described it later as being kicked up and carried into the king kingdom, kicking and struggling, perhaps the most unhappy man in England that night. Conversion came later a few weeks later. The next few weeks were key to his life. And he, he could not describe what happened. He spent the whole of the rest of his life trying to work out what happened. He knew it was God, but he was smart enough to realize there's no simple formulaic version of faith. Our faith is much richer than that. It's not reducible to a series of propositions. Sure, you need propositions. The church spent a lot of time over propositions, but Theology is our work, not God's. And we are fallible. So our theology always shows the marks of when it's written. It's not surprising that Catholic theology is dominated by a sense of awe uh, and that hell and damnation uh, were much bigger in their theology because they had no control over nature. It was a fairly terrifying world in many ways. So it has a much greater sense of awe in God's presence a much greater sense of the greatness of God and the sinfulness of man. Now, our theology was written largely after Galileo, Kepler, Newton and company had given us a mechanical metaphor for the 
the universe. Everything had its place. So the problem with theology written in the 17th century is that it was written in the 17th century. So every I had to be dotted and every T crossed. God doesn't like that. He, you can't do that to God. That's its defect. Of course, it's breaking down now because people writing theology now, people like Tom Wright, who have some sense of what's happened, especially the greatest intellectual feat of the last century, which was what? Quantum physics. And if quantum physics doesn't rattle your cage, you need to read a bit more. When one electron goes through two holes simultaneously, and our God is logical, where do you go? Well, this is metaphor, isn't it? The, pro the problem is not with, with the quantum physics, the maths always work. It is that we don't have a metaphor for quantum physics. It is not describable in that way. Obviously, an electron is not, an el it is not reality, it's a model of reality. So is an atom, so is a quark. Uh, they are a ways that we humans have managed to build a model that makes some sense of the data. But God, he's much more than this. He's basically saying to us, look, can't you get the message? I'm bigger than you are. <laughs> All the way down, he's leaving little notes and we don't seem to be able to read them. Didn't you expect this to happen? <laughs> we don't do it. But, but what it is doing is opening up, for those that are willing to see, uh, a new way of reading. Uh, not changing anything fundamental. The, the great creeds are not going to change. Isn't it crazy that when we set up a new organization, we write our faith statement? I mean, they spent three centuries. Why do you bother? Why not just take the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed? It's worked well for 1,700 years. It's not likely to cause a great deal of trouble. And it'll, it'll pre prevent a lot of others. So Jesus was talking to Matthew and these people about how puny our hearts and minds are, how sinful they are. And he says, but the kingdom is yours. It's not exactly the four spiritual laws, is it? Just face the facts about who you are and you've got the kingdom. That's what Jesus says, so it must be true. Now, obviously, Jesus knew that when you become that honest, you inevitably go, in the end, to the source of all truth, which is himself. Our journeys are very different. Our children's journeys will be very different. The only question I think you need to say to your children, don't ever lie to me, please. Make your home a place where when the truth is spoken, the first thing that is done is that the truth is celebrated. It may be necessary that punishment follows, uh, but it ought first to be greeted by the affirmation of truth-telling. Uh, and then you work out. You can negotiate with your children. They know when punishment is appropriate and a defined punishment, whoop, it's over, done with, that's fine. Uh, the relationship is unbroken, but celebrate the truth first. And you're on the way to the kingdom. In fact, you have it. What happens next? You see, the, you don't have to, I said to somebody yesterday, uh, they were talking about this, I said, well, you don't have to remember this, the Beatitudes. That's the wrong way to do it. You have to know them. Then you don't have to remember them. And I hope that that will be true of all of you this morning. Now, many of you have heard this before, but Several have said to me, when I said that Jean had asked me to do this, they said, good. <laughs> uh, there's certainly nothing that I've done that has brought me more joy uh, over the last few years than, than talking about this sermon has done. The other things are trivial by comparison. Um, the next one, of course, is blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. You see, it's not enough, is it, to see the truth about who we are. We need to repent. Can we do that at will? Can you repent at will? Just think of your relationships with your spouse. Is saying sorry repentance? Well, it may be, and it may be not. In my case, it rarely is. My wife, being more honest, just doesn't bother to say sorry. Uh, it'll come later in some explicit action that indirectly that uh, 
she acknowledges that she was wrong. <laughs> uh, we have different ways of doing these things. Men largely say sorry, having no intention of taking any notice of what's going on. They're just saying, can we return to normal relations, please? Uh, they usually aren't even really aware what they've done to cause the drop in temperature in the first place. Uh, that is not repentance. That is manipulation. But what Jesus is saying here is, blessed are those that mourn, who are given, listen to this, the gift of repentance. Do you know where that phrase comes from? The gift of repentance? Well, it's in the story of Cornelius. The first coming of the gospel to Gentiles, big time, against Peter's will. And then he had to go back and tell the old Jews what he'd done, and they were not yet ready for this. They were a bit rigid. And Luke, with his marvelous capacity to nuance the situation, describes what happens. And you can almost hear the amazement in their voice as they say, Then to the Gentiles also, God has given the gift of repentance. That's what persuaded them. It's what should always persuade us. Repentance. There's no real salvation without repentance. It's not, as Lewis puts it in Mere Christianity, something that God demands of us that he could forego if he wishes. No. Repentance is simply a description of what coming to God is like. What does that mean? If there's no repentance in your life, there's no coming to God in your life. Sorry, but it's as straightforward as that. Which is the reason I go to a liturgical church. Because I can't even drive to church without needing repentance. And when somebody said it well, why would I say it badly? You know, that's, it's, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We've followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. There is no health in us. I need that every week. And then the reminder, we are forgiven. Now I'm ready for communion. See, if I was a pastor, the church would have one major change. The singing would, follow, would be the end of the service, not the beginning. I think when you sing first, you're practicing pop psychology. When you have repented, had a creedal statement, had the scriptures read, had them expounded, had the Lord suffer, you ought to have something to sing, sing about. Uh, that's the way I'd do it anyway. Uh, I rarely sing the first hymns on Sunday morning. Uh, sometimes. They have to be the right nature for me to sing them. But happy songs? <laughs> no way. It's not for me at that point. That's something God has to do. So, mourning. And then he says, I can comfort you. And even that word has a sting in its tail. Uh, the quickest way to point it out is by going to the Bayeux Tapestry, where it has Bishop Oddo comforting the troops. So says the rubric underneath. And Bishop Oddo has a stick, a chain, and a spike ball in his hand, and he's driving the troops into battle. That's comfort. The comforter, the one who drives you into battle. Uh, but that's the subjectivity. Uh, and God gives that every now and again. It doesn't matter. Subjectivity is in God's hands, not yours. Don't ever worry about it. And certainly don't major in feelings. Enjoy them when they come. And remember them. Write them down if they're good. Because... The only thing you can do with the subjectivity of your faith is remember it when you don't have it. You can't recreate the subjectivity. That's God's province. In perhaps my favorite of all Lewis's many wonderful word pictures is the one about joy. Do you know the one? Joy is the perfume that is left when God has passed by. And God passes by when we have seen and acknowledged the truth and repented. That's when he turns up. Uh, he can turn up any time, of course, but he turns up 
predictably at that point in many ways. And, of course, Christian joy has got nothing whatsoever to do with your external situation at the time. He can overwhelm you with joy anywhere, anytime, any place. Read Richard Wurmbrandt's account of God visiting him with joy after he'd been beaten up by the secret police in Romania. There he was in his cell, injured and dancing. God can do that. I can't imagine him doing it to me or Graham. I say, I'll, I'll die and go to heaven when I go to church and see Graham doing a liturgical dance. You know? <laughs> but uh, God can do what he wishes. Now this leads to the next, and for me the most difficult uh, of the, the Beatitudes to come to terms with. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And the problem is the word meek, of course. I knew it had nothing to do with weakness. Uh, gentle Jesus, meek and mild is exactly the wrong picture. Uh, you shouldn't get your theology from hymns. Uh, you need to know what the word meek means. Now, I remember in Jamaica hearing the word used in its old sense. The Queen visited when we were there. And the Jamaican people said, she meek. And what they meant was, she has a sense of herself which is so who she is that she doesn't need to put on airs that's what meekness is uh, a right understanding of yourself in relation particularly to God and the other use of the word which helps to tell you what that right understanding is I got from Barclay I think the word prouse which is translated meek also is used to describe a horse that has been broken in, trained, and is ready to ride into battle. Do you get the picture? You are meek when you wake up in the morning, rub your eyes and say, my goodness, Lord, you've forgiven me for no reason at all. Thank you. Ride me into battle today. That's meekness. Have you ever gone to work thinking that you're being ridden by Christ in that metaphor can change your day <laughs> because it's wonderfully releasing as well isn't it does the war horse have any big plans for the day <laughs> none at all and you don't need any either you see students often ask me to talk about guidance and I always refuse I say I don't do guidance but if you like I'll talk about obedience because that's what guidance is if you love me, keep my commandments. That's all you need. It's a fairly big topic, but that's all you need. It's the whole thing. Think of the war horse. Sensitive to the slightest touch on the, the bridle or the knee or the stirrup. And with only the responsibility to stay upright and keep the rider in the saddle. But the rider, in our case, the metaphor breaks down because this rider wouldn't fall out anyway. But we are to put our foot down on the next piece of solid ground, that's all. And it's likely, because this is the way the sermon works, that the next bit of solid ground will take you right back to where? Poverty of spirit. This sermon takes forever because it's iterative. Every half verse has the capacity to take you back to poverty of spirit, to come through mourning, and meekness and then you go on again you get another half verse and whoop you're back to the beginning again it's uh, sort of if you like uh, a divine snakes and ladders that's the way it works and you inherit the earth doesn't look like it to me what have I got wrong well it's easy isn't it actually who was richer mother Teresa or princess Diana it's a no-brainer, isn't it? But it's also very profoundly countercultural in America. Who was, in fact, the more beautiful? Mother Teresa wins again, doesn't she? Those wrinkles, so beautiful. The inner spirit. The American system, what a disaster. The only thing that plastic surgery does is turn your face into a mask and thereby gets rid of all beauty of the real variety. 
all the subtleties of the little twinkle of the eye, the, the subtleties of facial muscles. And however good the plastic surgeon, ultimately he leaves behind more scar tissue again and less of those wonderful muscles that make our faces readable. No. Go God's way. The beauty of the spirit, of love expressed in smiles. Or not, whatever. Always around it works. Oh, my children love me even when I'm being me in not such nice ways. It's an amazing phenomenon. That's what it's all about. We, we are to inherit the real earth, which is, of course, ultimately love, joy, peace, honor, beauty, fidelity. Note what these things all have in common. They have no material existence. The kingdom that God wants you to have has no material existence. It has an eternal existence. That's what he was talking about. This is a different way of doing kingdom, isn't it? It wouldn't go down well with the prosperity gospel types, I realize, but my goodness, it's the way to live. Where does this go next? Well, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Having tasted, you want more. Oh, of course, we're always ambivalent because we like our creature comforts. There's always those tensions. But we know, once, as Peter puts it, after that incredibly affronting sermon that, or teaching that Jesus does, imagine as a Jew saying, unless you drink my blood, you cannot be my disciple. Do you want to upset a Jew? That would be a good way to do it. And Jesus did it. And there were lots of them left. And he turns to the inner group, the same people who were there on that hillside. And he says, are you going to leave too? And what does Peter say? You have the words of life. I think he was thinking about that hillside. I think that's the Sermon on the Mount again. Jesus already got him before he knew about the cross. He didn't know about the cross then either. Where can we go? Once you've got a glimpse of this, where can you go? There's no other place to go. You might wander, but you're going to come back. You have to. There's nothing else to do. And he says they shall be satisfied. Uh, and righteousness, remember, is at least a three-part thing. There's personal righteousness imputed to us. There's moral righteousness, which can grow in us as Christ grows in us. And there's social righteousness, which is clearly taught in the, the Bible as the outcome of a, a lively church and, and a God-fearing people. I have given you this law that it might go well with you and your children forever. That's a social thing. So you need at least all three levels when you talk about this. You can see why this sermon could take forever. I'm delighted to get that. You said a couple of hours. I might take you seriously on that. That, that would be wonderful because I've never had more than an hour before. Uh, I need about three or four, really, but we'll, we'll get through it in two. Uh, the first half will only be the Beatitudes and the immediate bit, and the second half will be the rest. Now, what does that lead to next? Well, what we've dealt with in those first four is the first table of the law, in effect. There's no, this is no accident that you can divide the Beatitudes and you can divide the law in the same sort of way. Uh, the first concern, our vertical relationship with God. The second, our lateral relationship with one another. Um, and we always get these things out of order. Uh, in America, you can see it very clearly. It shows in church architecture. What's the difference between the medieval churches and ours? Well, it's lateral and vertical, isn't it? Now, you go into a medieval cathedral, what two things do you immediately do? Look up and whisper. You lower your voice and raise your eyes. Now, you go into an American church, what do you do? You look side to side and you chatter. It's the second table without the first. Well, the first is first. We can't be surprised that our children, who are facing a much more serious world than we were, look upon our church as trivial, because it is. That's our job to change it. At least create, surely there could be one service a week that was built on this kind of model, Jesus' model. So now we start on the lateral things. 
And my goodness, does he know us. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. The only thing that Jesus repeats in the sermon, not in quite the same words, but have you ever noticed what follows the Lord's Prayer in chapter 6? Anybody tell me the, the, the comment immediately after what you would recognize as the Lord's Prayer? Isn't it interesting? You're all keen. You've all read it. We don't read carefully, do we? He says this, If you do not forgive, you will not be forgiven. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. It's the mirror image, if you like. What's he saying? He's saying this. If you are carrying a grudge against anyone, you have not understood your own forgiveness. You need to go back to poverty of spirit and ask God to show you what this grudge is doing to you. Our church is full of such people, isn't it? People who know the truth but are trapped at this level. It's utterly destructive. The most miserable people on earth are actually in church at the moment in North America. You know them, don't you? Faces that haven't cracked in a good belly laugh in the last 20 years. And goodness knows, God made us very funny, didn't he? Doctors at least know that, you know. (laughs) We are such funny creatures and the things that he makes us addicted to, like sex, it's even funnier, isn't it, really? Uh, It's utterly undignified. He doesn't want us to be too full of ourselves. There should be lots of laughter in the church. We're very funny creatures. Uh, The laughter should be at ourselves. My kids, uh, sometimes when I'm doing these things, what I'm doing is incredibly serious. And yet at the same time, there's a level almost of levity underneath it, humor at least. Why, God, would you be having me, of all people, do this? Grace. But the humor of it sometimes almost overwhelms me. I have great difficulty keeping my face straight sometimes. And my children don't bother, you know. And that's wonderful. He can fit all these things together. But mercy is the proof that you have understood the first four. If the first response to you being put down, bad-mouthed, or any of that sort of thing isn't, Lord, thank you, I could have been doing it instead of receiving it. You could, couldn't you? We are unputtable downable, if you like. I can't be insulted. (laughs) There's nothing you can say about me that I couldn't tell you worse that I already know. And it's forgiven. What more do I need? Can't I extend that to other people? Don't carry grudges. Get rid of them. Go back to poverty of spirit. Ask God to show you what they're doing. Give you the gift of repentance. And let him show you how to deal with it. There is a use for it. And we'll come to that in the second half. It's an amazing way that God does this. It's all nailed down beautifully. So forgive. Practice forgiveness. You can't do it on your own. But you can ask for the gift of repentance and work your way through. So that you at least carry no more grudges. Now you've got good reason for carrying grudges. In many cases you have been offended. You have been bad mouthed. You have been abused. Don't make it worse by carrying the grudge. That's being beaten up twice. Forgive, as you have been forgiven. What does that lead to? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. See, the only person that you care about in terms of judgment is Christ. The only person that you need to care about in terms of offense is Christ. Because if you're in a right relationship with him, all the other things, as we said earlier, will be right. Uh, Purity of heart, as Kierkegaard put it, Schaefer notwithstanding. Kierkegaard had many great things to say. He's well worth reading. Schaefer did not understand him. Uh, He got things wrong as well, but we all do. He said, purity of heart is to will one thing. That's it. Eliot said of one line from Dante that it was the greatest line in the whole of literature. In his will, our peace. That's it. That's what we're talking about. Purity of heart. Uh, 
to will one thing and you're free. My cynical, flippant description of this beatitude for the university was, blessed are the transparent for they shall be removed from all committees. <laughs> you see, because when you're only concerned about what God wants, what our Lord wants, you see through committees. Even in church, committees are about secret knowledge, aren't they? It's our job to destroy that. There should be no secret knowledge. All you need to do if you want to get off a committee in the university, if you're forced to go, sit there, say nothing, listen for the piece of secret knowledge, the insider information, and then say, that's very interesting and important. Who should know that and how do we make sure they do? You won't even get the minutes till after the next meeting. <laughs> yeah, that's the way it works. Um, and Christians buy into this way of doing things, don't we? We shouldn't do it. We shouldn't do it. The criteria for leadership in the church are character, not skill. And the character for the New Testament is set out right here. It's the people who exemplify the Beatitudes who should be leading, making the decisions about the church. You can hire the skills to do the accounting right or whatever. That's a different matter. But leadership requires wisdom. And wisdom, this is Christ's wisdom. This is blessedness. This is the kingdom. Uh, and the promise, the, the way I know that I'm not pure in heart is that I haven't had the beatific vision. Not in the way that I want it. I mean, how often do we have a close encounter with God in our lives? In my case, twice perhaps, perhaps three times. Uh, and they're stunning, aren't they? They put everything else in perspective. My favorite example of that is Thomas Aquinas because there was a man whose summa was the greatest intellectual feat in a period of five centuries. It was an amazing uh, applied uh, work of the mind which still keeps people busy to this day. I mean, other philosophers come and go, but Thomism is never going to go away, this side of heaven. But at the end of his life, a few months before he died, quite in his 50s, uh, Thomas was in the chapel saying his prayers. Another monk was there and Thomas met with Christ. Now, the other monk could see that Thomas had a vision of some sort, but all he heard was two sentences. Jesus said to Thomas, It is well done, Thomas. What do you wish? And Thomas said, Only you, O Lord. And he never wrote another word. And he referred to the greatest intellectual feat in five centuries as mere straw. One sentence from our Lord of approbation and everything else does not matter at all. Gone. Puff of smoke. That's what we're after. It's worth it, obviously. And that's what he's talking about here. Those kinds of people become inevitably the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. You see, peacemaking requires transparency because both sides have to trust. And you know that you're doing it in the way that you ought when they recognize it's not you, it's your faith. They say, we need a mediator, will you do it? We know you can because you are a Christian. That's what they ought to say. That's what you want to hear. Not because you're you and you have gifts of mediation, but because you belong to the Lord and he is the mediator. And that leads necessarily to the next one. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You will not be thanked for making peace for a long, inevitably and continuously. They'll shortly go back to their usual ways. And they'll want you out of the way at that point. Now, the persecution in our world is minimal. And it doesn't hurt anyway because we're free of that. Uh, but some. You don't get the promotions perhaps that you should have. You don't get the honors that perhaps you should have. I mean, a classic example would be giving the Nobel Peace Prize to Médecins Sans Frontières uh, that have been around for a few years and is basically an unlicensed brothel. And 
caritas that's been at it forever and they say nothing about it. I mean, that's just, that's the modern world slapping itself on the back and saying how good it is. That will happen. Uh, it's an incredible state of affairs. But that's a fallen world. And so you get persecuted in some parts of the world very seriously. I mean, to become a Christian in a Muslim world is to put your life on the line immediately. To become a Christian in China is to put your, your career on the line. A stunning example of this that, that I know is a friend of mine who was uh, executive director of CMDS Canada for years, Bob Stevens, was traveling in China on a train and he had to go to the toilet, which is not a good experience, but uh, there was a man cleaning it and he was humming a hymn. And so Bob Stevens joined in the music and amazingly this toilet cleaner could speak English. It turned out that this young man had got all the way to his final examination for a PhD. And at the final examination was a Communist Party member who normally said nothing. But he asked this young man, are you a Christian? He knew that if he said no, he would get his PhD. If he said yes, he wouldn't. And he said yes. That's persecution. That young woman I told you about who was dragooned into doing an abortion as a Christian, that's persecution. It's coming. It's coming. But Jesus doesn't make any apology. He said, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And it's the only one he repeats. He says, blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you for my name's sake. Rejoice and be glad. Now note, that means that rejoicing in the biblical sense cannot be a feeling. Because you cannot command your feelings, can you? You can control them, but that's not commanding them. Your feelings are what they are, and they come when they do, unbidden. No, Christian rejoicing is rational. Jesus gives you two reasons to rejoice. You are in good company. They did the same to the prophets who came before you, and you have a reward in heaven. So you do have reason to rejoice. And when you think that thought, you can rejoice. It's not, you don't have to create the feeling. That's not our province. Jesus does it other ways. Now what Jesus has done in this process is to lay out the character traits that you have to allow him to develop in you with you working alongside your will and his will. You know, let me misquote a verse from Romans and see if you can pick out what I've done wrong. If the spirit puts to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. Now that's a misquotation. Anybody correct it? That's right. It's, always read the small words in the Bible. It's Romans 8. If you, by the Spirit or through the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. It's not let go and let God. And it's not you on your own. It's you by and through the Spirit. Uh, same thing is happening here. You can't rejoice on your own, but by being obedient to God and doing with the experience what he tells you to do, he can do that to you. And he wants this character for the two functions that we have to fulfill, salt and light. So the next two metaphors, and I'll break after these two metaphors. Is that okay? Salt. We don't understand this metaphor very well because he wasn't talking about sodium chloride. He was talking about rock salt, which is lots of, lots of insoluble salts, phosphates and carbonates and the like, and a little bit of sodium chloride. That was so valuable in the ancient word that the Latin word for salt is salaire, from which we get salary. People were paid in salt. And what was its primary use in the ancient world? That's right, preservation. Uh, the housewife went to the market to buy a sack of salt to preserve her meat and fish for the winter. And she would taste the top of the sack to see that it was salty. And a good businessman would make sure that it was. 
But if that sack had stood in a puddle of water at some point and then dried out, it would look the same because the volume of the sodium chloride is minimal. But it would have lost its function. Do you get the metaphor? We are the salt of the earth. And we think, the salt that's lost its savour, what does it mean? It's that salt that's gone and you're left with the dirt. It's absolutely wrong that perception is everything. It looks the same, but it's lost its function. That's many Christians. And unsalty Christians, says Jesus, are good for nothing except to be cast out and trodden underfoot of men. You cannot even put it in the compost heap because it will wreck it. The only place to put it is on the path and let everybody walk on it. It's okay there. It's a pretty frightening metaphor, isn't it? These are the people in church whose faces are not happy this morning, not joyful. They're unsalty. See, when the world goes bad, whose fault is it? When the fish started to rot, did she blame the fish or the, or the salt? She blamed the salt, didn't she? Because it was this mixture. So when the world goes bad, when disordered sexuality, child abuse, divorce, all these things happen, whose fault is it? It's ours. Because we have been such wimps. When the world goes bad, the church is to blame. When the world goes bad, it's only doing what comes naturally when we are not fulfilling the function which God intended us to have. When we lose courage, when we do not say the things that ought to be said and do the things that ought to be done. I love that story from the mayor. That's a turning point for me. Where they actually got the Christian students, they're a good little group there, I know them, and they went to the, their mentor and said, this is abuse, and he went and did it right. Scriptural way, just went to the guy and said, this course is unacceptable. And he laughed at him. He then went to his brothers and sisters and said, will you join me in signing a petition to say that this course is unacceptable in the Mayo Clinic Medical School? And a lot of important names in the Mayo signed up and the course was gone. That's salt. That's what we're talking about. Now, what about light? Well, that's the gospel, isn't it? Now, I, I, one day I'm going to ask one of those disciples, did you laugh? Because when, if Jesus, imagine yourself sitting on a hillside, politically without power, no education, no future, the Romans run everything, and Jesus says, you, and you, and you, and you are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Ah, you could laugh if you're a cynic like me, you would. But he was right. They were. And he said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a lamp and put it under a cover, but on a stand that it may give light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. If they, glory, if they give the glory to you, you miss the point. You're back to poverty of spirit again. This is what we're about. This is the kingdom. This is what we want to be. If this is what we want to do, this is the way you do it. Uh, it's a lifetime's training program. Let's take a break there.